Welcome to the Studio 5 special presentation. We're taking you inside the hiding place, exploring the heroic life of Corey Ten Boom, and uncovering rich lessons of faith, family, and forgiveness. Welcome to this special edition of Studio 5. We're taking a look at the theatrical stage play based on the life of Corey Ten Boom. Like a memoir, it is called The Hiding Place, and it's on film for all to see Corey and her family's efforts to save Jewish refugees during World War II. We're chatting with the star of the production, the writer, and the director. Let's begin with Nan Gurley, the actress portraying Corey Ten Boom. The Nashville native has a career that spans more than 30 years, but this role is one of her favorites. Oh, my dear Cornelia Arnolda Johanna Ten Boom. My little Corey. When did you learn you were gonna get the privilege of fulfilling this role. And the privilege it truly is, mm -hmm. Ephraim, I'm glad you said that. It was one of those phone calls that you never forget. <laughs> I couldn't wait for my husband to get home. Mm -hmm. When he walked in the door, I said, you will not believe who just called me and what has been offered to me. And the first thing out of his mouth was, you were born to do this. <laughs> when the time comes for courage, your father will give you everything you need. So you're the best person for us to ask, who is Corey Ten Boom? Mm. She was the first licensed female watchmaker in Holland. She was born into a godly family. I have stared into the great darkness, Pickwick. I'm a witness. She is a hero because at a certain moment in time, she was tapped on the shoulder and given the opportunity to join the Dutch resistance and be a part of the underground to help rescue Jews during World War II. What brings you to town this morning, Willem? I have some news. Ah. She and her family <clears throat> for generations practiced hospitality. In fact, her, her grandfather, a hundred years before World War II, began a weekly prayer meeting in their home for the Jews. Anti-Semitism was already on the rise. And so the groundwork was laid there for godliness and for hospitality. So when the moment came in 1940 for them to be a part of this, they just continued to practice hospitality. But now the stakes were very high. Now it was a life and death opportunity. Confess! We kept no Jews. We conducted no raids. We kept no Jews. We conducted no do raids. Do you know your father and your sister have already confessed? Why do you think it's important for this to go from stage now to screen? Because it will reach so many more people. We'll get to know this story. The current generation doesn't know a lot about Corey. And it's so important for this story to be retold and retold. Not only from the standpoint that if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it, mm -hmm. but also we need to be encouraged. We need to know the names of the people in that cloud of witnesses. And the fact that it's going to be global now just thrills my soul. Amazing. How did this change you? Well, you can't read this story without going, what would I do? Besides just admiring her so much, I had to make personal application. And it has caused me to, to reflect and decide what hills will I die on? What, do I treasure Christ above all else so that I would be willing to die in order to stay faithful to Him? So it, it sort of gives you this perspective on what's important and to decide now. And now's the time to decide it, Ephraim. Yeah. Before the heat is cranked up on you, decide it now. Draw that line in the sand now and go, okay, this is what I would die for. We kept no Jews. We conducted no raids. We were watch keepers. We kept our watches. We kept watch. And Nan Gurley isn't just an actress, she is also an author who's written books like Little Rose of Sharon and In Adoration of the King of Kings. They're available to you right now. 
still to come. There was always not just watching history, but a real personal conviction amidst this story. And I think we knew we were handling something precious, something powerful. Our Studio 5 behind the scenes look at The Hiding Place continues as we talk to director and designer, Matt Logan. And welcome back to this special edition of Studio 5. We're giving you a behind the scenes look at the theatrical adaptation of the stage production, The Hiding Place, shot during its month long run in Nashville about a year ago. Matt Logan is the production's director and designer. I'm leaving my position at the church. What? But how can you, Willem? I think ministry is not my calling after all. But what will you do? I've opened a home for the elderly. Ah, the elderly. There's a great need for it. There are more every day who need help. Well, this is a surprise. But it's a good surprise. Isn't that right, Papa? I'm sorry, Papa, but the Lord has called me to new work. Well, well then, you are... You are right to follow it. Take me back to a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. What was it like doing this production? It was, it was kind of pulling a lot of people that I'd worked with through the years, kind of the best of, mm -hmm. um, to collect once again. And there was such a sense of unity I think everyone believed in the project and um, they knew that we were gonna do something special. Why this story? Pete and I have done a lot of work together and we've talked about a lot of titles. And every time we talked about Hiding Place, Corey's story, we knew it was special. There was something about that story that always struck me in a sense of what would I do in that situation? There was always not just watching history, but a real personal conviction amidst this story. And I think we knew we were handling something precious, something powerful. If you could, as best you can, describe this story as the director. This was a family who just were going about their lives. They were older. They could have just continued. But instead, they decided to reach out in hospitality, in love, in action, risk their lives for people they didn't know. But they believed in it and they believed it was the right thing to do. And I think that is one of the most significant, significant pieces of this story, as well as the push to then forgive. What new did you learn? That's a great question. You know, I think I was always, uh, I was intrigued by the hiddenness. There are some great things in the film that just the hidden behind that influenced me as a designer, mm. um, knowing that that was a fascination um, as we made the walls translucent so that you could see beyond the walls that you could see people hiding in them. Um, it was such a core point to the title, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I loved that as a kid. It had a mystery element. I think as I grew as a person, as I got older and now presented it, the weight of it was entirely different. I think the struggle to find hope is something that moves me um, every time I see it. Our time here is nearly at an end. My patience thins. We kept no Jews. We conducted no raids. Is that so? What about the timing of this? How timely is this story, although we're looking at many years and years ago. How timely is it? You know, I think that there are a lot of reasons we keep coming back to titles, coming back to stories that matter because of the relevance. To me, it's entirely relevant. My hope is that audiences would find new things every time they watch it. There isn't just one single message. There's many from every time that Papa said a prayer to his conviction to open his home, to help those in need to also um, his sacrifice. You are a Christian, yes? I am. Is there not a commandment that condemns those that bear false witness? There is. But you consider yourself exempt from it? No. And then you get to act two. And then you see the struggle for faith, the struggle for hope amidst the greatest darkness. That I think is so timely, I feel like that element of this story will always be relevant and we will always need to hear it. 
The Hiding Place marked the start of two new ventures, Matt Logan Productions, as well as the launch of Rabbit Room Theater. That's now the theater production arm of the Rabbit Room. We need to take a quick break, but before we do, it is time to share this week's story in pictures. Here's your Studio 5 snapshot. We take a moment to remember Paul Rubens. He's the actor and comedian whose Pee Wee Herman character became a 1980s pop cultural phenomenon. He died Sunday at age 70 after a private battle with an illness. His character delighted fans in the film Pee Wee's Big Adventure and the TV series Pee Wee's Playhouse. This brief look at memories and pictures is this week's Studio 5 snapshot. Just moments away. I felt very keenly that I've got a job to do and that job is to honor the legacy that's, that's come before me. We continue our deep dive into the legacy of Corey Tin Boom with a man who played a key role in turning the hiding place from a book to a stage play and now to a film. And welcome back to this special edition of Studio 5. We continue our conversations with the key players in the stage play that is now a film, The Hiding Place. Pete Peterson is the playwright and producer. That is Fraulein, you all know heroine protecting the weak. You are no martyr who will be remembered. What you are is simple. You are a liar. What's the process of turning the hiding place into a stage play for you as the writer? That is a great question. Uh, so I went into it with a lot of fear and trembling. Uh, and as soon as I understood the seriousness of it, you know, I felt very keenly that I've got a job to do and that job is to honor the legacy that's, been, that's come before me. Tell me, Fraulein, what does God think of those who lie, those who steal, those who hide secrets from the law? Has your God not put the authorities in their places? Does he not command you to obey those that he has raised up? We kept no Jews. We conducted no raids. Perhaps it would help if you considered me a priest. So my wife and I jumped in a plane and started in Amsterdam visited the hiding place in Harlem mm -hmm. uh, where Corey lived. We crawled into the hidden compartment ourselves, wow. you know, spent several days getting to know the folks there. And then we drove across Germany to visit Robinsbrook concentration camp. Mm -hmm. Until you've been in a concentration camp, you can't really fathom how big the evil that happened was. Mm -hmm. To walk into the gas chamber and then to literally stand in front of the oven where Betsy Ten Boom was disposed of. You know, that's a, a process of research that really fundamentally changed my relationship to the story. So when I came home, I felt like I was really equipped with uh, everything I needed to be able to start telling it in my own way. How would you describe this story to someone who hasn't seen it? Yeah, well, it's funny is if you go out into the world and say, hey, do you, have you heard of T Corey Ten Boom? You tend to get one or two results. So one of them is, oh my gosh, She's my favorite person. I've read her book 20 times. The movie's my favorite thing. She's the greatest person in the world. The other response is, wait, who? I, I saw it as my job to see if we could bring this beloved story from the last generation to a new generation so that it's not lost. And here is a family who hid Jewish refugees during the Holocaust, and many of them paid the ultimate price for it. And it's important that we look at the reasons that they chose to do that. So in my opinion, uh, it's just incredibly important that we uh, have the responsibility to help the world remember. And if I am to be a good one, I must testify. How would you describe this family? What was it? <laughs> what? Yeah. What clicked in them? They are a unique bunch. The Tin Booms, uh, remarkable people. Uh, one of the fascinating details about all of it is that a hundred years prior to World War II, uh, the Tin Boom sort of patriarch established a prayer meeting once a week for the Jewish people. And then a hundred years later, it's remarkable to me that uh, their family finally gets the knock on the door and says, hey, that thing that you've been praying about all these years, now this it's time to put that into action. And they did without dropping a, a beat, you know, they. They, I like to say that in the context of World War II, which was a shooting war, the Tin Boom family miraculously chose hospitality as their weapon. What's the greatest lesson this project has taught you? Great question. 
One of the things that I latched on to really quickly when I read the story was the um, idea of theodicy. Theodicy is a philosophical word that means how can we believe in a good God that permits evil? And as I was working through that, I encountered this story in the concentration camp of communion being taken by the prisoners and the, somebody had smuggled in the communion host and the prisoners were giving communion to one another. And it was beautiful. And then in the context of that, there was this recorded prayer by a nun who was in the camp. And I can't quote it verbatim, but she was saying essentially, Lord, thank you for our sisters here and the love between us that this experience has cultured. And we pray that uh, on the day of judgment, that those that put us here uh, would be passed over because of the love that we have for one another. So they're praying for the Germans who put them there and they're appreciating the love that bound them together while they're in this situation. And so all of that really forced me to realize that in the context of theodicy, how is God good and permitting evil? There's not an answer to that question. What there is is an action. And God's action is he enters it with us and in the process of communion, he is with us bodily, physically, in the darkness, sharing in our suffering in a way that is mysterious and beautiful and difficult and hard to understand. Uh, but that's why these women have come back from that situation and told us as witnesses, this is a cause for gratitude. And Peterson is not just a playwright, he's an author, editor, and speaker. He's written the revolutionary war adventure novel, The Fiddler's Gun, and its sequel, Fiddler's Green. Just moments away. I have stared into the great darkness, Pickwick. Actress Nan Gurley has a final word to wrap our special coverage of the theatrical and cinematic adaptation of The Hiding Place. Welcome back to Studio 5. Music helps us to bring this show to you every week, even in our special reports. And this week, our soundtrack comes from a member of Elevation Worship's team who released a solo project. Take a listen and you'll hear why Tiffany Hudson's Break the Bottle is what's playing in my ear. Just about out of time for this edition of Studio 5, but before we go, let's look ahead to a story on next week's rundown. Everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants a high place. Singer and songwriter Tiffany Hudson is a familiar voice and face with the Grammy Award winning Elevation Worship Team. And now she has a solo project. What's hidden here is. in Studio 5 on the day of its release. Now, if I'm correct in what I've read, you had no plans of doing a solo project? <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> yeah, I really like just never had it in my heart, never was a desire to do my own project or to write my own songs necessarily, but just felt like the Lord had invited me into this process. It was early 2022 where I felt like I started to sit at the piano and started to write songs that maybe didn't feel exactly like what we would sing on a Sunday morning at Elevation. It mm -hmm. felt more like me. It felt more like a personal, devotional type of song that I would want to say to the Lord. We've only got a few moments left in this show, and we're going to give that time to actress Nan Gurley, who has the starring role of Corey Tin Boom in The Hiding Place. What do you think for Corey and Betsy? What was it that clicked? Where did that come from for them? That strong commitment, conviction, grounding, where do you think that came from? They unquestionably believed in the sovereignty of God, that His unseen hand was behind everything. And I think that conviction, and they grew up in this home where they, every night at dinner they read scripture and their father prayed. And you know, if you have that kind of foundation, you're ready when the test comes. What's your hope now as the world gets to see what you guys did night after night. What's your hope now? I hope that hope will rise up 
in fainting hearts. And that people will say, those who don't know the Lord, will say, I want what they have, what they had, because Jesus is the highest treasure. Nan Gurley, thank you. That is a great final word for this edition of Studio 5 and this week's look at uplifting entertainment. Until next time, make time to uplift someone around you, and then come on back. See where Studio 5 takes you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching.